This is the Garden DC podcast, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 191 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Mary Chiepo, an ecological landscape designer, about the ubiquitous use of plastic in gardening. The plant profile is on native azaleas, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events, and this week's garden tasks in the What's New segment. We close out with the last word on herb garden labels from Christy Page of Green Prints. This episode, we're joined by Marie Chiapo. She's an ecological landscape designer, and we're going to be talking all about the use of plastics in gardening and how we can reduce that for our carbon carbon footprint and to be more eco-friendly gardeners. Welcome, Marie. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for having me. Great to have you on. So this has been a topic that's been of interest to me for several years. I've been following all the sustainability reports. I'm a member of Green America and always looking for ways to reduce, recycle, and repurpose. But before we get into all of that, Marie, we're going to dial it all the way back to baby Marie. And I'm going to ask you, were you born with chlorophyll in your veins and a green thumb? I was not at all. I actually uh, had absolutely no interest in gardening whatsoever. My mother did not garden. No one in my family gardened. So it was something that happened to me, I would say, not midlife, a bit earlier than midlife, but I discovered it and uh, it's been a joy ever since. So did you have a family member or anybody else who gardened? So my sister, when she left the household, uh, was an avid vegetable gardener and she lived in northern Massachusetts close to a farm and she had a beautiful beautiful vegetable garden so I would I would go there and help her out I think I think that's what sort of introduced the idea to me and at the time um, I have a graduate degree in public health and I certainly was not in the world of gardening but I was in the world of caring and doing something for the public and doing something that's healthy Uh, and so I just decided on a whim that I would try gardening. I went to a Master Gardener program, and as they say, the rest is history. I worked at the New England Journal of Medicine for five years, and that really taught me and reinforced my skills in research. And that was one of the reasons why I wrote the report that I did. So we'll talk about that report in a minute, Marie, but first I want you to let listeners know where you're located at the soil, the planting zone, and what you grow for yourself? So I live on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. It is very sandy here. The soil is very infertile, and the water drains very, very quickly. That's the majority of it. I would say what I'm, what I'm doing currently is I'm in a new residence. I purchased a home three years ago, and I'm creating a native plant demonstration garden for the public to come and see what straight native species look like and how we can incorporate them into our landscapes. So that's the majority of the self-gardening that I do. So not so much edibles, more into the natives. Yes, definitely. Interesting. And so how is it gardening there as far as the weather, the climate? It is very different. So I lived in, I lived closer to Boston Mm -hmm. for the majority of my life. And down here it is windy as heck. So that is definitely something that I've, I've noticed. You don't want to put certain shrubs in places where they're high up and they're apt to get, uh, you know, winter burn. And I would say it's just, it's more challenging, but at the same time, it's, I, I, so I moved down here to, to uh, access a new ecosystem. As nerdy as that sounds, that's what I did. I wanted to find out what I could grow in sand. And it's very different from where I was for the majority of my life. And I, as I always say to people, there's a native plant for every place. And I, I have proven that. Mm-hmm. I think we'll have to have you come back on another time, Marie, to talk about 
that type of gardening because we have so many listeners who are, you know, on the coastal plain, on a beach or sandy conditions. And, you know, a lot of us are in clay on the Piedmont side of things, but, you know, we're not as much hearing about those conditions for, I would say, beach side or sandy side or coastal plain gardeners. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a neat. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then let's talk a little bit about the gardening services you offer. So when I started out years ago, I was trained, as I said, as a master gardener. And at the time I worked with a woman who had her own business. It was a design and build, maintain business. And I worked for her. Unfortunately, she became ill and she literally gave me what she called her garden families because she loved the people that she worked for. And I was very fortunate to be adopted by them. And from there, I joined the Native Plant Trust in Framingham, Mass. And I learned about the science and the ecosystem. So the work that I do currently is based on on life and the interactions that life has on one's landscape. So everything from the microbial activity in the soil to the sunlight to just the birds, the butterflies, everything. So it's one big, beautiful system. And that's, that's what I do. I I create these little systems for people. Excellent. And I assume you are mainly in that Cape Cod area that you're working. Yes, I am. Yes. I do some, I have some projects up in Cambridge, Mass. So I do leave the area for something really, really special. Mm-hmm. I also um, do meadow projects. I'm involved in a very large meadow project with Mike Nadu, who's one of the founders of the Organic Land Care Program in Connecticut. He is the king of meadows, so we are involved in that right now. And it's a, it's a very steep learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of laughing about the king of meadows. I guess it's a, a self-proclaimed royalty. It is, but I have to <laughs> say that he, he's... He has, he has noticed as such. So mm-hmm. he has done a, a amazing work for, for many amazing people. So I'm very, he's a good friend. So he has joined me in this journey to teach mm-hmm. me how to do this. Because it's, it's really, it's an art. Mm-hmm. There's an art to it. Yeah, I think meadows are, are a difficulty for a lot of us East Coast gardeners. Yes. Well, and, and it's in a wetland meadow. Mm. So it, it's particularly complicated. But as, as I said... You know, there's a, there's a native plant for every place and mm-hmm. the soil was depauperate. And when we got the soil results back, we were jumping for joy because that meant we didn't have to do anything at all. And we could just put in the plants that belong there. That sounds like a wonderful project. And now I hate to turn our talk away from plants and growing and wonderful uh, gardening over to a topic that I think a lot of gardeners ignore or would like to ignore, which is the overuse of plastics in the horticultural industry. Um, What brought that first to your attention? I was on the sustainability committee of the Association of Professional Landscape Designers for a number of years. They were aware of an amazing recycling program at Missouri Botanical Gardens that had been and you know, they, they'd been doing it for, I think, nine or 10 years at that point. And they were forced to shut down for a variety of reasons, funding being one of them. And the woman who I'm on the committee with was curious to know, okay, so obviously this is an issue. People don't know what to do with their pots. And we need to find out what, what the story is. What's going on? What happens to these pots once we are done with them? And... Um, What's their, what's their true life cycle? And it was, it was a deep dive and a real, eye, a real eye opener. So I spoke with scientists, researchers, people in the recycling industry, environmentalists, gardeners, growers, you name it. And this was all during COVID. That's what I did. And um, I discovered that 95 to 98% of the plastic pl- plant containers or pots end up in landfills. And for me and people who learned about it at the time, it was a real eye-opener, a very sad eye-opener. 
Hmm. And I remember when that report came out, and we should let listeners know how they can access that report. So I have a website called sustainableplantpots.org. Uh, if you go to that website, you will find articles that I've, I have written, but on that site is also the report that I wrote. You can also find it at the Healthy Planet HealthyPods.org website that's through the Association of Professional Landscape Designers. Yeah, I think that's where I had gotten the original press release from them and started to see some of that research. And that, that report is very thorough, yes. but it is a couple years old now. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the updates or new research that's going on since there. But I do want to talk about the report itself and ask, um, what was the reaction when that came out in the industry? It was dumbfounding. People didn't believe it. Uh, I would... I mean, for understandable reasons, it was, this can't be true. There's no way. We've been trying to do the right thing for the longest time. I, I recycle. That's, those are the comments that I heard. And as somebody who works with the, the land and the earth and trying to do good things, um, it's, it's really a sad truth that we had to come to terms with. And I don't think we, still, we have yet. <laughs> but um, it took a while for it to work its way to the general public, but also to growers and to people in the container manufacturing industry, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Yeah, and I think those of us who love gardening, those of us in the horticultural industry, we think of ourselves as the original green industry. We are green. Yes. That's what we, that's what we grow. Yep. But then there's like this, you know, dirty behind the scenes secret that almost all of that is grown in plastic and how to get beyond that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to get beyond, and it's gonna take time for that to happen. But even, even nurseries that I'm familiar with now, when I ask them, what do they do with their pots when they're done, I still get the response, I recycle them. So what, what is out of your, that's not presence, for, you know, out of your, your, your vision, you, you just imagine the truck comes, picks it up, and takes it to the proper place. Whatever that is, mm -hmm. that's what one what imagines. So for 23 years, 22 years, I was bringing my pots to my recycling facility in Needham, Mass, and putting them in the container and thinking, okay, I did the right thing. There they are. Mm -hmm. And that was not the truth. In most cases, where are those ending up in the end? In landfills mm -hmm. with the rest of the trash that we dispose of from home or any other trash, but it ends up in landfills. Hmm. And so for those of us who have mandated recycling programs, you know, and been doing it for years, and like you said, thought we were doing the right thing, what is a better alternative? So a better alternative, we're, we're, well, at present, we're kind of stuck. We are in a situation where plastic is where it is, and... Um, what I say to people is if there's any way that you can clean and, and use your pots for something else, that would be wonderful or share them amongst yourself. But I think for those of us who are designers and landscapers, the realization that we go through thousands in one, in one season is, you know, it's, it, we can't say that we bring them home and we can clean them and distribute them to friends. It doesn't work that way. So, um, it's been, and it is a huge problem across the country of what to do with these. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I would say our first step is, of course, reuse. If we can reuse them right mm -hmm. away for the same purpose, pretty much potting up plants for a plant swap or exchange. Yes. And then, of course, those get planted and then they might get used once or twice more. Um, but there is an end life uh, after a while. They're not the most strong, usually. Yes. They will mm -hmm. crack and fall apart. So then at that point, they would have to go into a recycle bin. There's not much choice for, for the end consumer. Well, I wouldn't even put it in a recycle bin. I tell people to put it into their trash mm. because there's no other place to put it. Mm -hmm. So the other option is to ask your nurseries if they are willing to take them back. I'm sure across the country, someone somewhere is taking pots back and reusing them as much as they can. Again, as you said, it's a product that, or it's a material rather, that has a certain lifespan. 
and eventually it will not be usable again. Uh, but at least in that case, the hope is that that grower or that nursery is purchasing less mm -hmm. of, of the, you know, non-used pots. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another option. Yeah, I do know a few local nurseries and garden centers in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, one that's closed now, unfortunately, after several generations who used to have a pot pile in the back and you could just come and take some and you that's could drop great. them off. Um, so that was a good uh, service that they offered. And others will take back if you bought it directly from them, the mm -hmm. grower, because that's their 3.5 inch pot. You know, that's the other problem, I think, Marie, that we should talk about with pots is all the different sizing and not matching yes. um, with each other. So we'll get into that in a second. But those that will take it back um, and then they will have to sanitize the pots. So then you're using water and whatever else to that you use to sanitize because you can't always trust that what was grown in the first place is disease free or free Absolutely. of insects or, or other issues. Absolutely. And that's actually one of the reasons that pots are not reused because it's costly for a grower or for a nursery to collect them and to clean them. And it's much cheaper and easier to just get new ones. Mm hmm. So that's very typical. And do you know what that average cost is? Is it like a penny a pot for some of those? That's a good question. Um, I should ask my friends that are growers. I honestly mm -hmm. don't know. What I do know is that the cheaper the plastic, the cheaper the pot. Mm -hmm. So there are different plastics used in horticulture. There's um, what's called number twos or high density um, HD polyethylene. And number six, which is, I want to say that's polypropylene, um, and seven, which is, I should have looked this up before I, you and I talked, uh, that is low-density polypropylene. So that's mm -hmm. um, referred to as LDPE. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that we use typically for trays and for cell packs are, are polystyrenes. Um, so those are the sixes. So the low density is four, the polypropylene is five and the high impact is six. Mm -hmm. And I think the ones that are sold locally here, usually six pack or four pack, they're kind of like very, very thin film almost. Yes. Those are not accepted in our local recycling systems. And they just say, just chuck them basically. And they tear, you know, in a second, you could hand yes. tear them easily so you really know the difference between those and then there's the like nice i'm going to call them nicer like one gallon on up kind of corrugated you might get a large perennial in it or a yes. shrub or a tree and they kind of have usually indentations in the sides for the roots mm -hmm. to bounce back off of yes those seem to last i'm going to say several years because i will reuse those almost indefinitely whereas the smaller pots the thinner you know, in between, we'll call them the film and that yes. have maybe, I'm going to say two or three uses out of them. Right. Right. Exactly. And so the, the number two pots are, um, it's a material that is more, has more marketability. So it's a stronger plastic. However, those pots don't get recycled, but mm -hmm. the point is, is it is a plastic that jugs are made out of a lot of materials that we use on a daily basis are made out of. So they're more rigid. Mm -hmm. And, um, but again, if you are a pot and you're high density poly, you know, um, thylene, you're not going to, you're not going to get recycled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say those larger, we're going to call them one gallon on up, um, thicker ones, they have more purposes, I think, in the garden. You can use them yes. to store things in. Yes. You can use them to hold soil or mulch while you're moving things around. You know, I've, I always have a few on hand just to throw weeds in as I'm going around like a bucket. I'm going to call them bucket substitutes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Every, mm -hmm. Everything you would use for a bucket except for holding water, of course, because they have drainage. Right. So that's repurposing, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. So, you know, of the R's, we have reduce, which is great. We have reuse, which can happen, but is less likely to happen. Repurpose, which the better pots will, that, you know, people will use that, will use those, as you said. And there's recycle, which we know is not happening. 
So um, my my I'm not going to give away my secret, but it's another R. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So let's talk a little bit about the sizing that we touched on earlier. So that's my biggest frustration when, when we're holding our garden club sale every year is you get pots of every di- different dimension and size and it makes tabling and display super difficult. You know, some are yes. round, some are square, some are tall, some are short, some are just a little bit under four inches, some are just a little bit over four inches. So they don't fit back in the same trays of course that's the not. other problem so why are there so many different sizes? why is there not just an industry standard like there are for car tires like it's the one sizes but there's seems to be like an almost infinite number of different sizes well because pots are money so uh, people that manufacture them are always trying to create a different looking pot let's say if you're if you want a brand um, your, your plant in a certain looking pot, but also for growers. Um, I imagine there's a reason why one that's square and of a certain size is better than one that's round. I mean, honestly, I don't know, but ob- they're, they're listening to what the demand is and it is complicated. And plus, you know, the, as I've said, you know, well, I didn't say one of the major reasons why pots are not recycled is because the optical readers at recycling facilities do not detect black. Mm. So uh, they're, and plus they're dirty and so forth, and they know it'll mess up the recycling machinery. So they're disposed of if they even make it that far. But it's, it's really a a consumer demand issue. The consumer being the grower. Mm -hmm. So that's the grower who's purchasing the plants from the wholesaler, or it could be the garden center, purchasing them from, um, there's usually an intermediate grower, there's the plug yes. starter, and then there's the one who grows it on to full size and yes. then is selling it to the garden center so that um, that fulfillment in between. And yeah, I hear what you're saying about branding. So you, you've seen pots from everything from Monrovia to Proven Winners have their custom branding on it. Um, and they might have a custom color, or a pink or a green and a logo on it. And they're paying a little bit more of a premium, of course, for those pots. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I do have to, speaking of proven winners, I have to give them credit mm-hmm. because one of the other concerns or issues about uh, these pots is you cannot read the, the code on the bottom. Mm. So they, just, they very smartly said, we're going to put the code on the side of the pot and make it large enough so people can read it. Um, so... At least, you know, there's, there's, there's some effort happening there, Mm -hmm. but for people who are trying to collect the material, it's close to impossible Mm -hmm. to know what you, to know what you have. Yeah. But that's a great point that, you know, a little bit better labeling proven winners are white with black print. So I imagine that's much more recognizable in the system. And so that gives them a little bit more of an edge on that. But yeah, mainly all of our plant pots are black and sometimes yes. dark green. Yes. And sometimes I'll see a dark terracotta. Like you'll see mm-hmm. those. Usually it'll be herb pots or those darker terracotta. And I always wonder if it's just because that's how it always has been, but the black is absorptive, I guess is the best. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Brings in the sun, warms them up a little bit more, but also they're going to get dirty. You know, dirt is going to show. So it's got to be a dark color. Well, it's also because... There are certain time. There are certainly are times where it's a mixed plastic. Mm-hmm. That's that's another reason why it's difficult to recycle them. You can have pots made of a variety of plastics. You know that that definitely contribute contributes to to the problem that they have with recycling. But even though, and what's sad is just going back to the color issue. Even though they are a different color, it's not enough for them to be deemed recy- recycled. I mean, Mm -hmm. people, so there's a difference between something that is recyclable and something that actually gets recycled. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of work happening right now with people trying to what we call truth and labeling Mm -hmm. uh, and conveying to the consumer what, what, what really can be done with this container or this material. Um, But, you know, growers are trying, they're trying, they're trying to do the best they can. Yeah. And like I said, we, 
we've always considered a green industry and, you know, they want to do what's best. And of course they want to do what's earth friendly and uses the least amount of inputs, of course. So least amount of water use, least amount of energy and gas and, and electronic or any other usage. So one person uh, I had checked out recently was Lloyd Traven, uh, who has been a past guest on the show with Peace Tree Farm. He had uh, written a short article in a recent newsletter uh, why they had gone with rice hole pots for a while mm-hmm. and then why they went back to plastic. Okay. And I don't know if you saw that, Marie, but he had talked about the rice hole pots were coming from China. Um, and I think they were a comparative in cost, maybe a little bit more, but they were willing to pay that price. He said it was the huge carbon foot tr- footprint yes. of having them come from China that made them stop doing it. He was like, other everything else being equal, um, they're just locally sourcing their plastic pots at this point is the best um, solution they can come up with as yeah, a grower. Absolutely. I mean, it's, as I said, you know, it, it's, it's access and it's cost too. And, but unfortunately when the plastic pot was first quote unquote born um, shortly after world war two and um, discovered Mm-hmm. That is what was the, that that remains to be the default material that that's used because it retains it, it, it retains its, um, you know, its shape. It's malleable. They don't break. Um, you can transport them easily. So the horticulture industry actually was one of the fastest growing industries for years um, because of this plastic pot that came mm-hmm. to be. Um so even though we now look back and say, we want to be green, we want to do the right thing, the, the wheel has been, sin- been spinning for so long and so quickly that it's, it's almost, A, we didn't even notice it, right, that this was happening, but B, how on earth do we stop it? Yeah, and I, I was going to say, Marie, a little bit about that history, and you're talking World War II and post-World War II. Uh, how did we buy plants before World War II? I mean, I know some of the pictures I've seen where you went to a field and you had somebody dig the rose bush for you out of the field and I assume put it in a burlap sack? Yes, absolutely. Or a bare root. Hmm. They were also, they used coffee cans a lot, ceramics. Um, they would take the plants out, cover them with newspaper, or as you said, burlap, and put almost like this slurry on top to help the roots stay happy. But it certainly was not anything that would be considered highly transportable. So that's why um, it became such a popular product because suddenly this grower in Minnesota could send his material, his plants, you know, somewhere across the country because these containers would maintain the integrity of the product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that must've been, you know, almost as revolutionary as refrigeration being able to ship (laughs) To ship your produce across the country and then freezing like the bird what was his name Clarence Bird's Eye. Yes. Um, but I did see an example lately of a local garden center who bought, I think it was all their strawberry starts um, mm-hmm. from a, a wholesale grower on the East Coast. And they were all in these little paper pots. Yep. So these kind of recycled or pressed paperboard. And I will have to say, so disappointingly, I went back the next week. They looked great when they were delivered. One week later, they were dried out, shriveled hunks. Like they could not Hmm. keep them moist enough, even though they have a full-time staff and constantly watering. Right. uh, They just dried out in the greenhouses. um, And, you know, nobody wanted to buy. Of course. People were not purchasing these shriveled up little um, dried strawberry plants. So. That was a sad experiment to see. And, the, and their heart was so in the right place. Of course. Absolutely. Well, and I think you're going to find people doing more of that, sort of finding innovative ways and hopefully in ways that are successful and not mm-hmm. ways that are disappointing mm-hmm. to consumers. And yeah. I think we can keep trying. And, you know, for our, our own home selves, home gardeners, you know, are always inventive a lot of use of of course yogurt cups to start seedlings in making our own little newspaper pots i use um the like tubes from your toilet paper and paper towels are a super easy seed starting um 
use. You can just cut off a section and fold it. And those, those are perfect for that. And they're almost plantable. So you see, yes. um, I, I know cow pots is one brand and a few others that I've seen tout themselves as a plantable pot. What do you think mm-hmm. about those? So there is a difference between, um, so in the world of biodegradable, mm-hmm. um, just a little science lesson quickly, there's a difference between what is compostable and something that needs different kind of composting. So for the cow pots, those are, those are compostable. In other words, you can put them in the ground and they're going to biodegrade on their own. They're just, you know, nature, carbon, water, what have you, um, is going to take care of those. And, um, you, you know, if, if my feeling with that is if they work, it's beautiful for people. Um, the other issue is there's material that requires commercial, um, to material to be uh, commercially composted. And the, a lot of the material that's being created now out of uh, what's called bioplastics, which is a combination of protein, cellulose, um, you know, just natural material, and some adhesives are not something that one can just throw into their bin in the back of their yard and expect it to break down over a short period of time. So they have a longer life to them, but at the same time, they require different conditions in order to decompose. Um, And then, of course, you have the plastic, which, you know, doesn't decompose at all or biodegrade. So that's Mm -hmm. my science lesson. Mm. (laughs) So that, that reminds me of a press release I got recently from Proven Winners, and they have their Eco Plus containers line. Um, can you tell me a little bit that you know about that? So it's a line that is a bioplastic. Um, obviously, I don't know what the recipe is because I'm not their engineer, nor would they give out their secret, nor should they. Um, but it's made of a, a material that over time would decompose uh in the ground, I mean, it would take about five years or so for it to decompose in the ground. That material, in order for it to decompose over over a shorter period of time, requires a, to be in a certain temperature with a certain amount of moisture. So as we move forward with all of these bioplastics, a lot of them you're seeing in food products for cutlery and so forth, mm-hmm. I think... That Well, I know that's an issue that we need to figure out before we don't know what to do with this material, just like with the plastics. When the people created the plastics, it was a great material, but even the people who, 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 the chemists that created them had no idea what to do with them when you're done with them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that, that is definitely something that we need to be mindful of as we move forward. But it's, you know, that material, on the other hand, can be put in the trash. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to leach chemicals and so forth into the into the groundwater and the soil the way a plastic pot will. Yeah, and from what I'm reading, it's a byproduct of um, beets and corn. So your sugar Can beets. Be. Yep. Uh, that well, the, in this case, what Proven Winners is using, mm-hmm. and it's the starch. And they're saying you can plant it directly in the ground. It's not going to go away immediately. Um, they're and then they're giving compost locally or throw them away that in the landfill that they will decompose in the landfill versus as you said the forever life of a plastic uh right petroleum based product yes yes Mm -hmm. and there are other companies certainly hc companies was one of the first manufacturers of the fiber-based pot Mm -hmm. it's a great pot um it's being used across the country commercially it's also being trialed so This might be a whole other conversation on what it takes for growers to um, change to a different type of pot. But there there are alternatives out there that are being trialed and used, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah, I think a lot of people are trying, and there's going to be a lot of different ones we'll start seeing on the market and can experiment with in our own garden. Maybe like do an experiment in one compost pile, see how long it takes to break down um, compared to other things. Um, So I was going to ask you to talk about that third R that you said was a secret. Well, my, my R is redesign. 
So what I mean by that is it's going to take some smart people and they're, they're working on it. I'm on the Horticultural Research Institute's Plastic Task Force, and there's good work happening with uh, creating and trialing you know, pots made of different materials, and also the process. So not only um, what it looks like or what it's made out of, but how are we going to deal with them? So the, re the recycling process with these pots does not work. It, when, when, we, when China started, or I should say when China banned the uh, importation of our plastics, hmm. our infrastructure here in the United States was not at all prepared to deal with our own plastic. And we may be recycling approximately 8 to 9% of it right now. So imagine what's not available for the pots to be, to be recycled. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it, it's, and also redesign, I feel that it would be smart to create that tire tie, you know, Kathy, you know, mm -hmm. let's create a pot that's standardized and can be made of a certain size, made out of a certain material, um, that will be used. It could be branded as people like, but it's not something that that's going to leach chemicals into, into, into the, uh, the soil. Mm -hmm. And yeah, fracking, too. Exactly. And something that, you know, that industry standard, the same tray size, the same tagging yes. placement or same yes. tag material. Yes. And I have to say, Marie, that's my other biggest mm -hmm. pet peeve in plastics and gardening is all those plant tags. Like every single little annual has a little tag with it. I know. I know. Well, and those are, those are made out of polypropylene. So, you know, it's a weak plastic. Mm. And, but I went up to... East Jordan Plastics in Michigan last spring, which is a company that does recycle plastic pots, plastic material from the horticultural industry. And they had tags there. So people had sent them to unused tags that were still you know, like a sheet of tags that they're able to take, melt down and make into something else. So that it does exist. It's just not spread. It's not widespread, or I should say enough widespread. Um, but there are some companies in the United States that are, that are actually recycling, recycling the material. And I've been working with Connecticut um, and now Massachusetts. Connecticut has been collecting pots from landscapers, I think for the past two years. And they're working in concert with Maine and Vermont, uh, collecting the pots by, by number. So the landscaper or the grower, whoever it is, will put the pot in a bin labeled two, five, or six, because that's what they accept. And um, Pride's Corner in Connecticut picks them up and com you know, compacts them, bales them. And when East Jordan comes down to deliver new pots, they take the old pot pots back. So there are some systems in place that are giving us hope at least on how to reuse this material and not have it all go into, as I said, you know, into the soil. Mm -hmm. So um, they're, and they've been doing this for quite some time. They've been doing this for quite some time, but we need more of them. <laughs> we need yeah. more of them. That's and, such great news to hear. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to, for Massachusetts, um, I'm working with the MNLA and we're trying to collect them in Massachusetts and also have them, the same thing, you know, have the material uh, brought down and the used material brought back up. So it's, it's a great system. But overall, my goal as an environmental person is to say, let's either come up with something, you know, well, first of all, something that's standardized, mm -hmm. but also something that will decompose into the earth at, in time. It doesn't have to be five days. It doesn't have to be even, you know, five months but something that will biodegrade and not hurt, not harm our planet. That's my goal. Well, I think that is a goal to be applauded, Marie. I think that's wonderful work that you're doing. And in our last few minutes together, I was going to ask you to brainstorm with me ways we can reuse some more of those plastics in the garden. So one of the things I was thinking about that I do with my trays, and those are the trays that um, kind of are a web 
or webbing. They're not yes. solid on the bottom. Mm -hmm. I use those as plant protectors. So like when my baby seedlings are coming up on my peas, I'll put that you know, upside down over lettuce and pea seedlings, maybe with a brick on top to keep the squirrels and birds and everybody else who wants to pluck those tender seedlings out of there. Um, so that's one reuse at least for those, those plant trays. Yeah. And also, unfortunately, we also have, as you were saying in the beginning, we have plastic throughout the industry. Mm -hmm. The, the mulch bags, I can't stand. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I know it's the bane of many of us and, but I always, I reuse them as much as I possibly can. If I'm forced to use them, I use them for something. So when you're getting soil or mulch or anything that's in a big giant plastic bag delivered, I'm assuming Marie that you're being careful cutting them open. Um, so they can be reused for other things. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they can be, they can be depending on what it is. If it's mm -hmm. a clear material, you know, they could be used in a garden um, to help seedlings get started, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, but also I reuse them just tr for transportation of things. So, or, you know, I'll, I'll put, I'll put sticks or something in it or something or, or rock, something I want to use in another part of the garden. Granted, not all of the material is the same. The plastics, you know, vary in terms of how tough they are. Um, but for the bags that, are made of a material that can carry something, keep using them as much as mm -hmm. you can. Um, we are working on how to recycle these things. And um, it's a process, as I said. But this task force I'm very excited about. We have some big players there. And I think we have some great minds. And I think some really good stuff is, is going to come out of it. So great to hear that, Marie. And so how can our listeners contact you to find out more? Well, they can certainly email me, uh, Marie Chiepo, so it's C-H-I-E-P-P-O, at me.com. Also, the, my website, I have two websites, but the one that's um, solely about the pots is sustainableplantpots.com. Um, they can go through that and follow me on Facebook because I'm posting a lot on Facebook. I'm hoping to have a blog soon. Haven't had the time because my, as I say, my main job <laughs> is being a designer. So this is a very busy time of year for that. But um, I am, I am going to be the the opening speaker for the International Plant Propagator Society's conference in September. So I'm very excited about that because this is where the work starts. Mm -hmm. It begins with the growers. So I'm very excited about that. Absolutely, that sounds really exciting. And I was going to say for those listeners who are concerned about plastic use and petroleum-based products, um, maybe that's something they could take to their local and um, national legislators as well. Absolutely. And I really encourage people, if they're super interested about this, and I mean this, is to email me. Because the more information, the more people I have, that can help us with this, the better. So it can be a thousand emails. I don't mind. <laughs> Keep sending them um, because I'm going to make a master list. And, you know, the, the more people I know that are involved in this and interested in it, the it'll empower us because mm -hmm. demand is what really drives this market. Mm -hmm. And if I can just lastly say that a study that I've been, I didn't work on, but I'm very closely based, you know, in touch with, came out last year um, on the use of people that are environmentally based growers or gardeners um, and their belief systems. So they want to do good things for the yard. They want wildlife. They want butterflies and so forth. And the number one value that they had close to pollinators was recycling plastic material. Mm -hmm. And that really blew my mind. So Tell me about you. Get in touch with me. Let me know. I want to hear from you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marie. Thank you, Kathy. It was a real pleasure. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. 
So you want to find someone you're compatible with, specifically someone who's ready for a serious connection, totally open to having kids in the future, is a tall rock climbing Libra, and loves rom-coms with vegan pizzas on Tuesdays just as much as you do. Bumble knows that you know exactly what's right for you. So whatever it is you're looking for, Bumble's features can help you find it. Date now on Bumble. Native Azaleas, plant profile. Native Azaleas, rhododendron species, are flowering shrubs that are found in the woodlands on the east coast of the USA. They do best in light, dappled sunlight. One of the most striking characteristics of native azaleas is their strong, sweet fragrance that is often compared to that of honeysuckles. The flowers also resemble clusters of honeysuckle blossoms, hence the common name for native azaleas of wild honeysuckle. Native azaleas are deciduous, dropping their leaves in fall, while the Japanese and Korean azaleas are mainly evergreen, as are most of their hybrids. Native azaleas prefer moist, well-drained, and acidic soils that are high in organic matter. The Piedmont azalea, rhododendron canensis, or the southern pinkster azalea, is native from the Carolinas south to Florida and west to east Texas. The flowers are shades of white, pink, and red. It can grow to 10 feet wide and high and has an airy open growing habit. It is hardy to USDA zones 5 to 9. The pinkster azalea, rhododendron paracliminoides, is similar to the Piedmont azalea, but thrives in a more northern native range from Massachusetts to North Georgia and over to Tennessee. It is hardy to USDA zones 4 to 8 and grows to 5 feet tall and wide. The Florida flame azalea, rhododendron austrinum, is native to northern Florida and other far southern states. It grows to 8 to 10 feet tall and has yellow, orange, red, or pink blooms. It's hardy to USDA zones 6 to 9. The Alabama azalea, rhododendron alabamensi, is native to Alabama and Georgia. It grows five to six feet tall. It has blossoms that are white with yellow blotches. It is hardy to USDA zones seven to nine. The sweet azalea, rhododendron arborescence, can grow to 10 to 20 feet tall. It is native to the Appalachians from Pennsylvania to Alabama. It has white blossoms with red stamens. It's hardy to USDA zones four to seven. Native birds, especially hummingbirds, bees, butterflies, and other wildlife are attracted to these shrubs and their amazing flowers. Native azaleas, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, I have Wygelia and Azaleas blooming along with our Spanish bluebells over at the community garden plot. I've been harvesting asparagus and I noted that my thornless blackberry is covered in white blooms, which hopefully means a lot of blackberries this summer. The garden tips we shared this week included leaving the foliage alone on your spring bulbs. They don't need to be braided or tied or pushed down. Just let them fade naturally and after they've turned yellow, cut them off. Then give them a little bit of organic bulb food to encourage future spring displays. In local gardening events, if you're in the DC metro area, is the Virginia Garden Week Tours. These take place from April 20th to 27th throughout Virginia, and the official title is Historic Garden Week. You can find out about those tours all over the state under vagardenweek.org. Ledoux Topiary Gardens is hosting their 16th annual garden festival on Friday, May 3rd and Saturday, May 4th. The Garden Festival is Ledoux's longest-running fundraiser, 
and they have a curated collection of 40 exclusive vendors from across the eastern seaboard offering hard to find perennials specialty annuals unique small trees unusual exotics garden furniture urns and architectural treasures and this annual ticketed event brings in enthusiasts from far and wide rain or shine go to ledoogardens.com the bethesda community garden club is having their annual plant sale in downtown bethesda maryland on thursday may 9th from 9 a.m to noon at the farm woman's market You'll find hundreds of plants that thrive in our D.C. metro area. All are dug and potted up by the club members from their own gardens and are ready for planting in your space. And more information about that is available at BethesdaCommunityGardenClub.org. And next, the Silver Spring Garden Club is hosting its annual Garden Mart fundraiser sale on Saturday, May 11th at Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland that can be accessed free by anybody who would like to come and check out the sale. It starts at 9 a.m., ends at 1 p.m. Come early for best selection. There's a lot of categories that sell out pretty quickly, and you can find out more about that at silverspringgardenclub.com. And finally, on May 11th and 12th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. each day, the Garden Fair at Blandy Experimental Farm the home of the State Arboretum of Virginia is happening and there are 60 vendors offering the best selection of native plants, annuals, perennials, herbs, trees, shrubs, garden tools, and much more. Advanced tickets are $10 a car load or $15 at the gate and you can find out details about that at blandy.virginia.edu. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Get low-maintenance alternative to lawns with the new book, Ground Cover Revolution, by Kathy Jentz. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in homeownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer-resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. This is Christy Page with Green Prints on Sprouting Herb Garden Smiles, Whimsical Ways to Label Your Herb Garden by Amanda MacArthur. Ah, the innocent beginnings of a seed starter tray on your counter, basking in the sunlight until, oops, you forgot to label them. Now you're stuck in a game of guess that herb until those seedlings decide to sprout. 
We've all been there, my gardening buddy. But let's not even talk about mid-season herb hunts that feel like a chive hide-and-seek with parsley. Fear not, labeled herb steaks are here to rescue your herb sanity, adding a sprinkle of charm to your garden. For the adorable seedling stage, try toothpick paper flags. Use toothpicks with vibrant post-it notes or bamboo skewers if you're feeling a little fancy. These are perfect for indoor green endeavors, but not so weatherproof for the great outdoors. An oldie but a goodie are craft sticks or popsicle sticks. They make fantastic herb steaks for both indoors and outdoors. Opt for smaller sticks for seeds and seedlings and embrace the larger variety for outdoor herb escapades. You can get artsy with colorful sticks or use markers and paint for a personal touch. Just make sure to seal them up for outdoor durability. Next, enter the enchanted world of stick and twine herb steaks, my personal favorite. Picture a whimsical cottage core vibe with a hint of Bilbo Baggins garden charm. Grab some sturdy twigs, twine, and paint stirring sticks. Wind the twine in a figure eight pattern, creating a label hug for your herbs. For a robust outdoor herb declaration, try crafting stakes from sturdy scrap wood. Create a simple T-shape using two pieces of scrap wood, some nails, or a staple gun. This is your canvas. Practice calligraphy, add illustrations, or throw in some wayfinding symbols. Seal the deal with a weather-resistant sealant for an enduring herb ally. Whatever herb steak method tickles your gardening fancy, remembering you're doing it for future you, the one who might accidentally uproot an army of plants in your pre-coffee stupor, or the you that's sending the ever-helpful but sometimes forgetful partner on a basil quest. Future you will thank present you for these whimsical herb steaks. Trust me. This has been Christy Page with GreenPrints.com. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash Garden DC. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.blogspot.com. Thank you. You can find and follow Washington Gardener on Twitter, slash X, Instagram, and Pinterest at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook at Washington Gardener Magazine. Please take a moment to rate and review this podcast on Spotify and Apple. Open the Spotify or Apple app, search for Garden DC, check on the rate button, and select five stars.